Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Getting food from farm to market to table involves a whole array of actors, from smallholders to input suppliers to suppliers to traders, buyers, even, even bankers and service providers, even policymakers and regulators. Or what, we, at what, or what Feed the Future calls a value chain, and what some of the Europeans, including the British Department of International Development, calls a market system. So agricultural value chains are central to many FTF Feed the Future mission strategies to reduce poverty and malnutrition. Basically, value chains are seen as a vehicle for increasing smallholder productivity, linking smallholders to markets, and enabling that whole array of value chain actors to better compete in markets and to benefit from market participation. With the expected end result of increased incomes for all actors and increased access to a diverse basket of foods. But achieving these outcomes poses challenges, and I'd like to speak to three of them. First, it's not enough to improve smallholder access to improved in, uh, seeds and fertilizer and tillers and so forth. Farmers and other value chain actors need to be willing to spend their scarce resources on new technologies and practices. So projects need to figure out ways of reducing risks and ways of creating incentives that will motivate farmers, risk-averse farmers, to, to invest in innovations. A second challenge comes in scaling outcomes. Once a project has identified a model or an approach to get some results, it has to figure out ways of scaling new behaviors, of scaling adoption of technologies, of scaling new business practices. And third, the project needs to figure out ways to ensure the sustainability of these outcomes, that the adoption of innovations will be self-perpetuating, that local actors have bought into new ways of doing things, and that they are driving change themselves, and that the local market system functions in a way that enables continued growth and adaptation to new opportunities as well as threats over time without project assistance. So this morning, we're going to hear from two FTF projects. The first from Senegal, the Economic Growth Project, also known as PCE, and another from Ghana, the Advanced Project. Jean-Michel Voissard will present the first case from Senegal. He's from IRG Agility. And Tom Carr of ACA Voca will present Ghana. These presentations are going to basically focus on two things. One is the model that these projects developed or that evolved over time that enabled them to scale outcomes, that enabled them to address risk and create incentives. And secondly, they're going to talk about the results in terms of outreach to large numbers of smallholders, outcomes in the form of improved productivity and competitiveness, as well as evidence that these outcomes are sustainable. Following these two cases, Alan Gibson, uh, who has long advised DFID, um, will speak. Uh, he has been a key architect of DFID's Making market, Markets Work for the Poor approach. It's a market systems approach. And rather than value chains, DFID refers to this term market systems. And so Alan will comment on these two Feed the Future cases from this M4P or market systems uh, perspective. And then we want to open it up to the floor. We want to hear from you. We really welcome your questions, so please collect them. With that, let me turn it over to Jean-Michel. OK, thank you, Jean. Hello, everyone. Here I am again. Uh, OK, PCA, um, yes, an inclusive value chain project. And as I said yesterday, with a focus on rice, maize, and millet. Results, yes, there's, you have to understand that the project has been operating uh, across uh, three rain seasons. So we've been, the results we've achieved were achieved over three years. 
Um, we've got, we've reached about 45,000 farmers. 95% of them work on less than two hectare holdings. 80% of them uh, can be estimated as being below the $1.25 line. Uh, and of that, especially in the rain-fed uh, value chain, 50% of them, more than 50% of the beneficiaries are women. So, well, that's the stats. Um, in a more specific aspect, and I think that kind of exemplifies the methodology, we've had results in a series of technical areas. So, so as you see, you know, we've been working in Senegal, across Senegal, across the whole country, and the results, well, have been what? They can be summed up in just a few technical domains, but that contribute directly to the value chain's uh, competitiveness and to its sustainability. First of all, we've introduced new varieties. We didn't create them, we didn't invent them, but we scaled them up. And so we introduced the Nerica, which is an upland rice, high yield variety. Also introduced aromatic rice variety in the Senegal River Valley, which actually opens up big opportunities in the urban areas. But also we've worked on the seed certification process, working with government agencies making targeted investments in seed labs in the various areas to have proximity analytical services. And we've also developed uh, public-private partnerships in seed cleaning units and uh, really investing in the seed certification process, which means that overall we've boosted seed certification capacity and at the current date, there is a capacity in Senegal of 12,000 tons of certified seed production in the grain sector, which can really boost production and meet the Feed the Future objectives. Um, also in the finance sector, so it's not just technical, it's not just about seeds, it's not just about production processes, but value chain also has you know, an underlying base of financial services. And one of the big characteristics of this project is we've switched from what we, you could call equity-based lending uh, to cash flow-based finance. So the difference with that is that in equity-based lending, it's mainly about betting the farm or betting all your assets on, on some kind of outcome. Cash flow financing is really developing risk management approaches that enables you and basing the lending on how much revenue you're going to generate. So what it means is really introducing warehouse financing systems, basic, developing contract collateral, uh, introducing lease finance uh, for small farmers, and introducing various insurance products. All of these reduce the risk include and create a new form of collateral that has enabled us to expand credit and reach last year uh, financing outlays of over $18 million. Lease financing now has reached more than $4 million in terms of outlays to finance equipment acquisition by farmers who had no equity position. Okay. Um, another aspect was really the mainstreaming of certain low tillage techniques called generically conservation farming and um, introducing data processing and, and data really driven farm management activities at a wide level. All, all, all of these have actually contributing to developing a strong base on which to develop contract farming activity. Now, how do we do that? You know, all of this is nice. I mean, we can talk about each topic for about a few days, and we're not going to get anywhere because it's just technical work. But how do you scale it up? What was the approach? So we, I summed it up in just a few slides. One of them one of the big drivers of what we do is we cast a wide net. I mean, and we work with networks, pre-existing networks that have a trust capital with their farmer base, okay? And a vested interest in the success of the activity. Now, typically, of course, you will have the miller, you saw Dabafal here, who's part of a big, great mill, who's interested in developing, you know, strong linkages with small holders. Okay, that's one approach. But there's also a whole bunch of other networks, networks that are really at the grassroots level. Uh, for example, you can have a community leader who's a lead farmer and, and wants to develop, you know, a proximity level services for his tractor and really, you know, sees it as an opportunity of collaborating with other guys like him into some kind of federation. And that created the FEPROMAS program where 
One of those leaders called Nimda Jaiti leads 3,000 farmers that last year actually marketed uh, more than 26,000 tons of corn. Uh, then you, you'll have other kinds of organizations. I mean, um, women's self-help groups. One of the popular, uh, one of the big groups we've been working with is a, a women's microfinance institution that wanted to divest into uh, rice marketing and, and rice seed commercialization. And finally, the biggest finding was actually humanitarian NGOs. Humanitarian NGOs are actual market actors. They have a vested interest in developing value chain capacity in their farmer base because their vested interest is actually to leverage their food aid funds. So rather than distribute food, they'd rather distribute seeds. And so they developed very effective extension and development programs that really was the founding the foundation of the success of our NERICA program. So NGOs like Caritas and various other organizations actually became very effective in developing seed multiplication systems and certification systems and then marketing systems associated to them to expand their food distribution programs across Casamance. So this notion of having a good understanding of networks and also not just partnering with one you see, Dabafar was with me yesterday. She's Vital. She's part of a big company. But we also work with five other companies like that and also with various other networks. So unfortunately, if, Vital's comp if, if Daba's company goes bust, which can happen, okay? Well, we have uh, four other companies. Our focus is on the farmers, developing the skills with the farmers so that they can connect with one or the other and eventually negotiate one against the other, which is not a bad thing. Um, then another one, uh, another key aspect of what we're doing, and I think that was raised also in ba by the, the Bangladesh team, is you don't, in, you don't bring, you know, space age technology, I mean, you just don't take something and just plaster it there. Everything we've done was adapting existing concepts, okay, and bringing things that have some kind of relationship with actual practice. Uh, okay, for example, uh, the Africa rice varieties, I mean, had been tested, they were known, the practices were there. there was, it's just that they hadn't really gotten around disseminating them. We, we started with a root seed stock of two tons. Today we've got about 3,000 tons of it being produced. Next year there will be 2,500 tons of Nerica being produced by the networks. That's our job. We didn't invent Nerica, but we sure knew how to scale it up and focused on that. Another aspect of what we've been doing is in finance, for example, uh, but, you know, solving the whole rice financing program that helped DABA purchase 30,000 tons of rice was basically convincing the banks that they were already doing that. They were already using rice as collateral to purchase and, and settle transactions, but they were doing it for white rice in the port of Dakar using bonded warehouses to secure the financing of imports. And we told them, you have all the model. The practices are all there. Let's just transpose it in the Senegal River Valley and apply it to paddy rice. Same thing for leasing. The leasing company was used to lease television sets and cars and trucks and things like that. And we said, why don't you go lease tractors and combines and harvesters and let's develop the model you've developed for commercial leasing in the cities and let's bring it to the countryside. And that's how we got leasing into Senegal, working with things that already exist. Same thing for rice and, and corn norms. We went and took the WFP norms that are like five or six pages long. Rice, it's even worse. I mean, and we, we got the farmers together, but we had these norms that were known. We went through them and simplified them and said, okay, how do we transform them into efficient farm gate norms? But everyone recognized that these norms were already being used and were efficient, which actually secured buy-in and helped get things going. So you don't invent anything. You inspire yourself. You adapt. But you don't adapt alone. You adapt together and you turn it into a business-to-business -business process. You facilitate and you make them adopt it. And so that creates really full adoption and sustainability. Finally, Market, and I talked a bit about that yesterday. Market is actually, you know, you have to have a very subtle approach to market definition. 
as we say, you know, very often your projects complain about site selling and things like that. Oh, damn, these farmers, they site sell and our, our formal market and contracted market can't work. We say, yeah, well, that's okay. I mean, what, what's the problem? What's important is that farmers sell, okay? So if farmers sell, that's good. And you have to engage a dialogue with the farmers and saying, okay, let's understand it. How much are you ready to sell at that level? So you have to understand that markets have levels. And the first market is actually the food you buy yourself. So in, in Nerica, as I said yesterday, we found that the real cash market for Nerica was the cash savings that a farming household was able to make by being fully rice self-sufficient. Because before that, they would sell other cereals, other products to be able to buy rice during the hungry season and they were already spending money on rice. With Nerica, not having to spend that money created a cash windfall on which the farmer you know, could start taking a bit of money and betting on that windfall, buying a little bit of Nerica seed, doing a bit of composting and things like that, and getting the full yield, which creates a cash saving. That's the first cash market, which is, I put it in black, it's not a black market, it's the home market, okay? After that, there's a whole series of markets. There's the village seed level where farmers seeing that thing happening say, hey, I want that seed too. And so the guy saves seed on the side by his bed and sells it to his neighbors, okay? But also sells certified seed to an agro dealer who develops a local market and wants this kind of market. So this is, you know, and gradually as you move on, as surplus develops, then you have the local market. You've got the agri-dealer, you know, you have the, the middle, the famed middleman and all that. And gradually you move up, right up to the industrial firm. And in the Senegal River Valley, it's gone to the point that small farmers sell all their rice to Vital. It's a good price. Money's in the bank, they take part of that money, then they'll speculate on a tomato crop. And they buy their rice at the market because they find it more practical. So what I mean is this whole thing is we don't preconceive the market. We understand it, we look at it, and then we tailor the interventions and the financing systems to those markets and not raise expectations that will never be met because people don't really go for the full integrated model. Okay. So other rules, pricing. Pricing is not a big deal. Pricing is not the issue, it's not the end result. What's important is that people develop pricing skills and develop a constructive dialogue one, with one another. But in the end, the project is not part of the handshake. You let them sort it out, okay? And just to close, uh, all of these elements that I've, set, I've talked about are the building blocks of contracting. So you don't start with contracting, but you build the blocks and gradually you build trust across the supply chains, and then the contracting work really has a fertile environment to build. And so once that settles in and you create various cycles, then sustainability builds up and you can just go away and let them do their job, which is actually what Nimna Diaite told me. She said, we're okay, we can finance our maize thing. She's out there right now and they'll double their production next year. And we're not doing anything. However, she's looking at us to develop, to expand her warehousing system because she knows she's gonna have a surplus and now is the time she'll have to deal with the mills. And that's why she's really happy that we got this extension. But in the end, I have no worries. Nimna's gonna do it, is gonna be multiplied. All these things we've achieved are gonna work. Why? Because we worked directly through the systems, through networks that were there, that were not created by us, and that were there in the grassroots in the field. Thank you very much. Good morning. Let me just jump right in. The advanced project is located in the resource poor savanna, North Ghana, uh, north of the eighth parallel. We're working in northern region, upper west and upper east regions, 
and parts of Upper Volta and Bronico regions as well. The circles you see further south, one is the circle around Kumasi, which is a major trading city in the Ashanti region, and the Accra Tema area where a lot of uh, business and processing takes place as well. We're working with three commodities, maize, rice, and soybean, which are not necessarily uh, staple uh, staple commodities. They are uh, not necessarily staple to the north, um, and most of their markets are found south of the 8th parallel in the more populous south. The 8th parallel divides the country almost in half exactly, so 50% of our target area is North Ghana, 50% of the country with only 16% of the population. The farmer constraints are mostly environmental and geographic, one crop season per year. Distance from the port requiring uh, transport, long transport of, of inputs and so forth, fertilizers. Distance to the markets, everything is coming back south once it's produced. Uh, the poor savanna soils, which require a lot of fertilizer uh, and unpredictable rainfall. Generally, a resource poor population uh, with most people falling in the poverty definition. We work with 34,000 smallholder farmers, 38% are women. We've just extended the advanced project into advanced two, into its second phase, and we're hoping that that number will easily reach 40. I anticipate that the gender, the, the women participation of the project will easily be over 40, possibly 45%. $4 million in loan dispersed from financial institutions to the actors in the value chain. This is not a huge number, but uh, we've only been running the Feed the Future portion of the project since 2011 and when, during two crop seasons, 2012 and 2013. So it's a fairly significant number for us. The outgrower business model that we're following is, is, is a bit uh, non-traditional. We're starting with the outgrower business, um, linking to processors and end buyers. And of course, we have the outgrowers, the smallholder outgrowers. The definition of the outgrower business is usually a small commercial farmer who we call a nucleus farmer. Um, it's not an outgrower business that we have with plantation style outgrower systems uh, with tea estates and rubber plantations and so forth. These are um, small commercial farmers with 50 to 200 hectares themselves. Um, providing services to their outgrowers. They can also be uh, aggregators who are simply trading, um, um, but they do procure from the same set of outgrowers and they have a certain territorial aspect to them, um, but they do not farm themselves. The third category would be the farm, farmer-based organization or the FBO. Um, at the moment, we have very few, maybe only one or two, uh, that we can call a true outgrower business. Under the phase two, we're hoping to have several of them join in. The main function of the outgrower business starts off mostly with tractor services to the outgrowers. What we would like uh, to do um, is, and the tractor services are, are paid for um, by the outgrowers in, in kind um, produce. So uh, one it usually falls into an equation that uh, one acre plowed equals one bag of maize. The outgrower business waits three months for the harvest to take place to be paid back. Um, and the outgrower is also free to sell the remaining portion of his crop to the outgrower business. Um, but that wasn't normally the case before we arrived. The produce is then forwarded on to the buyer uh, or the processor. Um, in most cases, we encourage the use of contracts, and this is taking off quite quickly. Um, a few years ago, I would say none of it was sold on contract. Now, almost all of it is being sold on contract between the outgrower business and the processor. The, the contracts uh, is, is, a, is part of the project. We teach contracts, we teach arbitration, um, but like John Michel also mentioned in his presentation, we are not in the room when the contract is actually negotiated. 
we're encouraging, and this is where the game-changing aspect of this model comes in. We are encouraging the outgrower businesses to expand beyond just tractor service. Tractor, uh, tractor uh, plowing uh, alone does not increase uh, productivity. Uh, it just creates more, uh, more land and uh, that's being plowed. It's more of a labor-saving device. We're encouraging the outgrower businesses to um, provide seed and fertilizer, and this is working out slow but sure. Um, it is happening. We're also encouraging them, and this is much more enthusiastically adopted, um, post-harvest uh, shelling and threshing. Uh, and the buying, uh, the processor community at the top of the chain is also supporting this because it produces a, a higher uh, quality product free of debris and waste and so forth. I don't know if you can see, the, the last service we're encouraging the outgrower businesses to enter is the, uh, that of uh, extension uh, or field management is the way I prefer to call it because it's more than just extension on agricultural productivity, but um, for these outgrower businesses who have 200 outgrowers, which is uh, a starting point for most of them, that involves five or six communities, several miles apart. Um, this is something we're encouraging for them to have somebody on their staff to, to move around the communities and assist farmers on sales, on, uh, on the threshing and the shelling and so forth. With the advent of the uh, service being provided by the businesses to provide seed and fertilizer, the agro input companies come into the picture. Um, we started off with maybe only 30 who were participating, now we're over 70. Um, it's a, we find a lot of the southern-based companies have now started branches in the north. Um, there is a groundswell or increase in sales overall of, of inputs, uh, which didn't exist before. We feel that we're somewhat part of that, of that uh, game-changing picture, if you will, in the use of the inputs. Uh, we're, we're not going to be increasing productivity unless we have that increased use of inputs. With that increased use in, of inputs, we also need to ensure uh, contracts between outgrowers and outgrower businesses, um, especially since uh, a lot of this is being financed. The, when the banks or the financial institutions come in, um, we, we're finding that anybody with a contract, either between outgrower business and the processor, uh, and the outgrowers to the outgrower business uh, facilitates a, the loan process much faster. It, it adds a bit of depth to the application. If the bank is assured that the, that the outgrower farmer has a market uh, at a certain price uh, guaranteed and so forth, uh, the, there's a loan more likely to go through. So this is a simple, simple part of the value chain, if you will. Um, once the banking institution comes in, we also have to address the questions uh, of risk, uh, especially in a rainfall, um, unpredictable rainfall area of North Ghana. We have a private company that was formerly providing uh, weather information for the oil industry, for the oil rigs offshore Nigeria and Ghana, and they've uh, started working on a rain forecast system for smallholder farmers and commercial farmers, which we're supporting uh, by introducing the product uh, through an SMS system on cell phones. Um, we'll help them for a year or two in introducing the product, hoping that it'll catch on with the smallholder farmers. Um, we're also working with the crop insurance, the Ghana Agricultural Insurance Program, which is also being supported by GIZ. Um, we're helping them more in the market side, physical presence in North Ghana to help them market their product uh, a bit more aggressively. It is catching on, um, uh, which surprised me. I wasn't a big, uh, I was an advocate of it, but was a bit surprised that it caught on as quickly as it did. It needs a few more years to mature. Information is key, um, especially in, a, in an area that um, has the risks that it does. Um, I'm a long-time supporter of the radio versus uh, some of the other methods of communication, but we also support the up-and-coming ICT companies that are delivering messaging uh, 
uh, either SMS or um, voice messaging in vernacular, which is useful especially for women. Uh, so they can get both market and crop production information uh, during the crop season. So this is becoming a bit exciting in that, in, in that arena as well. We're also working with the, the ministry at several levels, um, but the most important level I think is at the extension level. We don't provide extension directly to outgrowers. Uh, we work with the district extension staff and we have a, a working relationship with every in about 40 districts that we work in. Um, we do not pitch up at our demonstration sites or uh, on farmer fields for farm training without the ministry extension agent with us. And what we're encouraging now is also uh, with the ratio of extension agent to farmer increasing with an ever dwindling uh, extension staff, um, we're encouraging the outgrower business to pick up the slack in this, uh, in this regard. Uh, and this is something we'll be pursuing during the second phase of advance. As outgrower businesses mature, um, many of them are becoming interested in, in having warehouses. Um, warehouses are, are fairly non-existent in the north, um, but are becoming uh, more desired and, and with the advent of several other projects coming in, uh, including the USAID World Bank uh, GCAP project uh, and other projects, especially with FinGAP, the finance project coming in. Uh, these can either be constructed through a, a, a grant and equity or a grant equity finance uh, system. So we're finding um, over the next four years, I would project that we're going to be constructing quite a few warehouses. But we also need them at the community level and we're hoping some of the outgrower businesses will help us, uh, will support the construction of, com of community-based warehouses. Uh, the key issue here is the ownership of the warehouse. Uh, we found that if the ownership was unclear, if it was truly just a community warehouse, that um, people were unclear on who was responsible for it. Um, and there are programs in the past that have occurred where these warehouses are still there, empty, uh, non-maintained. So we strive to, to make sure that these community warehouses are owned by either the FBO itself, a cooperative, if you will, uh, or an individual uh, lead farmer. As they connect to the, um, the community level warehouse, to the outgrower business warehouse, we're expanding into the area of warehouse receipts under the Ghana Grains Council. Ghana Grains Council has the capacity to certify these warehouses. Um, and these warehouses have already started issuing receipts. In 2013, we issued receipts to commodity valued over $2 million and were able to use receipts for financing, finance collateral to over a million dollars. Um, so we have, um, uh, we anticipate the sustainability of Ghana Grains Council will also be strengthened with the advent of the Ghana Commodity Exchange System, which is a a different set of players are engaged in that, a different ministry. Um, but we're trying to integrate Ghana Games Council warehouse receipt program into the overall commodity exchange system. So where is the USAID project in all of this? Well, I always like to tell my staff that we're somewhat supposed to be lurking in the background, um, supporting um, these companies, and most of this is public and private sector. Um, the arrows are what we create, the institutions are already there. Um, and we're using the usual tool chest that we have of grants, consultants, volunteers, uh, including Peace Corps volunteers as well as farmer to farmer volunteers, uh, technical assistance, our technical team, which is located in all three regions uh, and so forth. So we are the, uh, the glue, if you will, that holds us all together. But if you take away the USA, uh, USAID program, you're left with this more complicated looking value chain, if you will. And for the most part, these private companies will, uh, will remain and will be uh, in place, continuing the business that uh, has been started under the program. This is not a model that we created ourselves. The basis, the foundation for it uh, was already there. 
So if you, uh, to make the final point on, on scale and sustainability, the last, um, s the last arrow, if you will, that I'm putting up there is, is that coming down from the processor. And this is where I'm gonna get myself into trouble with you value chain gurus, um, because the investment coming down from the, professor, uh, from the processor um, in most models should be the first arrow that comes down and, and it follows the chain. In our case, we didn't have a processor expressing that much confidence uh, in, in this model, in the outgrower business, until we were able uh, to establish a, a, a more business-like environment for them to operate in. With the advent of the processor investing, we found that there are more outgrower businesses that can start up, and the outgrower businesses themselves are able to work with more farmers, and many of them have moved from 200 farmers to 800 farmers. So just quickly, uh, this investment coming from the processing side over just the last two years was more than two, $3 million uh, of their own funding, 77 input dealers uh, involved and so forth. At the bottom, you'll see um, the real um, litmus test, if you will, of the, of the results. Both crop yields uh, and gross margins have increased significantly. As you know, you can have yields without the profit and you can have profit uh, without the yields sometimes as well. But we are having two to three to four fold increases in productivity on these commodities uh, uh, as well as on gross margins. At the end of the day, it's not just about the numbers, it's about the people that we work with, uh, the 20,000 people receiving messaging and the 4,000 women who have been trained on numeracy, the construction of warehouses, uh, cost of $10,000 to a simple $50 dibbler uh, that a woman can use on her soybean farm. At the end of the day, it's really about the people. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to talk about something slightly different. I'm not going to talk about one specific project. I'm going to talk about the perspective of DFID. DFID is uh, the UK's USA, I guess. That's the best way to describe it. DFID is uh, the UK's official bilateral donor. I want to talk about DFID's perspective on the challenge of improving the performance of farmers and reducing poverty amongst, amongst, uh, amongst farmers. And this is manifested in an overarching approach, which goes by various names. It's a market systems approach. It's called making markets work for the poor. And in that familiar way we have in development, it has a rather irritating abbreviation, which is M4P. I'm going to talk about the M4P uh, approach, which is at the heart of all DFID's work in private sector development, not just in value chains, but in finance, in land, and in other spheres of economic development. I know there's an uncanny uh, ability we have in development of different agencies pursuing the same objective, but appearing to have entirely different approaches. The good news, the good news is that uh, this approach is uh, first cousin, I think, to uh, the value chain approach, which Jean has already talked about. And although the uh, terminology and language may be different, they, we are essentially on the same page here, and there's much to learn from uh, mutual learning between the two agencies and the two approaches that, that are, are, are being followed. So I want to talk about Diffid's perspective. Diffid's perspective um, on, on, on this, I want to present the key aspects of the M4P approach. In doing so, I'll refer occasionally to the presentations from Senegal and Ghana. Uh, and what I hope we can get from this is uh, some idea in the room and some consensus in the room that the way ahead for development agencies in relation to uh, um, value chains and relation to improving the performance of farmers is all about it's all about systems. It's all about value chain systems, market systems. So, where does this approach come from? Well, this approach comes from DFID. Uh, um, first of all, recognizing what the goal of development was, is. Development is, is about sustainability and scale. It's about trying to reach lots of people in a meaningful and lasting way, as Jean has mentioned already. What it's not about not about is scatterings of small scale activity, little puffs of impact here and there, flurries of virtuous activity that 
together signify very little. Yet, yet, too much of our experience was precisely that. And that forced David into a rethink, a rethink of what it was about and a number of basic realizations. The first of those was that may be obvious to us all that poor people don't exist by themselves. They are always part of a bigger system. They don't exist in magical isolation. And that means when we're talking about farmers, it's not just about who they sell to and buy from, about all the other stuff around farmers, which are necessary to make value chains work more effectively, which previous speakers have already referred to, whether that's to do with information, with inputs, with certification systems, with standards, with uh, storage, with finance, the other things that together make for an enabling environment that can get the best uh, uh, out, of, out of farmer systems. Um, so different recognized the importance of systems and recognized that in order to intervene effectively and get to underlying causes, that meant looking at different players within a value chain system. It recognized also that if you can tap into the energies and incentives that you have within market systems, the potential is there to have uh, more substantial, more transformational impact. You can tap into incentives, you can tap into people's energies, you can, in that, bit, in that way, uh, encourage growth, innovation, and continual improvement, and improvement without us as development agencies. And DFID recognized the potential of market systems and recognized, therefore, what their role was. Their role was and is about trying to facilitate, trying to catalyze market systems so that they work more effectively and work more effectively for poorer people. So DFID's arrival at market systems, at this approach, initially was based on failure, not a word that they use very often, but it was based on a recognition that we can do better. But increasingly, it has been based, is based now on uh, experiences of significant success. So what is this approach? What is this approach that I'm talking about, I refer to as M4P? Well, it is about uh, achievements. It's about trying to get to scale and sustainability. But what are the key elements of the approach in practice? Let me try and introduce to you five key simple questions which help us to understand what this approach is about, what the key aspect, which define this approach, and if, which constitute a lens through which we can look to assess whether our own development projects are in pursuit of systemic change and market system change or not. I'm gonna run through these very quickly. This is a, normally a two week training program. You get the five minute version. I'll speak quickly. First question then, first question then when we're thinking about this approach is first of all, is the underlying rationale, is the logic actually about, about systemic change? Are we trying to improve systems or not? Or is our approach actually about, about something else? Is it about, is it about simply delivering impact directly? Um, is it about buying impact, which we can easily do with the development dollars we have at our disposal. It's, it's pretty easy to buy short-term and illusory puffs of impact, which can look very convincing. Uh, you can buy machines, you can buy inputs, you can, you can provide information directly. Um, but that doesn't really get to underlying causes, it doesn't really address uh, underlying problems. And it's interesting that when we, we've, we've heard from the two previous speakers, how much of their work is all about trying to facilitate a wider system. Without, without saying it, these two projects were really about trying to get the wider system to work more effectively. So that's the first question. Are we serious about this? Is, is, is a focus on systems really what we're about? Second question, do we know enough? Do we know enough about the market systems that we're trying to engage with, the value chain systems that we're trying to engage with? Do we know about how they work and critically, critically why they don't work what are the underlying constraints? This is an analysis-led approach, which means we need to understand not just the symptoms, but the underlying causes. And that means we have to continually ask the why question. For example, farmers, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward to say that farmer practices may be poor, and the reason they're poor is because farmers lack access to information and knowledge. 
And uh, we might say, well, that's the, that's the problem. That's the constraint. The real underlying issue there is why the information system doesn't work. Why is it the potential providers of information and knowledge, such as the media, such as radio, such as input suppliers, such as government perhaps, why, why don't they have the incentives or the capacity to provide information that farmers uh, need? That begins to get to the underlying cause. You know, one simple way of thinking about this approach and difference from conventional uh, approach to development is this. In a conventional approach to development, we, we think about what problems do businesses have, what problems do farmers have, and how can we solve them? With this approach, with a systemic approach, we ask another question. Yeah, we try and understand what farmers' problems are, but then we ask, well, why isn't the market environment, why isn't the world around farmers providing a solution to those problems? To, to those problems. Why isn't the market system working effectively for the poor? So we need to ask that, set that, 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 that next question. And, and that then guides what our actions are. We analyze so that we can have focus, focus in our interventions. We can focus on where underlying causes are and that's what we should be about rather than dealing with, dealing with symptoms. So analysis is important, it's an inherent part of the approach. It, it, it enables us to be focused, it enables us to have coherence and to focus on a wider system change rather than chasing around endlessly after, after problems. Third question to think about is this, do we have a realistic view of how the value chain system should work in the future, of how it should function, how it's going to work beyond us, without us. Development is not supposed to be, development agencies are not supposed to be there forever. That means thinking about the future. It means thinking about how it's going to work post-project. One way of thinking about this is to think about well, all these different functions that we've talked about, all these different things going on within the system. Who's going to do these? And how is that going to be resourced in the future? Who does and who pays? And that in turn takes us to other questions about uh, what the incentives are people have to, to provide and what capacity they have to do that. I mean, generally, in, within development, we underemphasize the importance of incentives. Capacity building is something we've got lots of effort into because it's a kind of worthy, uh, a worthy thing that we can all support. But if we don't tap into incentives and shape our uh, interventions around incentives, then we're misunderstanding how market systems work. So we need to have a view of the future that is realistic, that is based around incentives and capacities. And that means we need to ask ourselves a few questions. We need to ask, we need to ask uh, who's going to provide things in the future? We need to think about not just the physical things like machines and seeds. We need to think about who's going to provide the information that so often we provide directly. How is that going to work in the future? And we need to think about that, importantly, because development is not a static concept, because sustainability is not a static concept. Market systems evolve and they develop and they have within the capacity to change and to grow. And we need to think about how that's going to work uh, beyond us. So two final questions. Two final questions. Is our, inter our, interventions, our interventions consistent with what we understand to be good practice? We have learned in development over the last few years. We have learned about who we should be working with, how we should work with them, how much we should be providing. Many of the, uh, many of the experiences that we've heard from Senegal and Ghana uh, reflect those. So we need to be thinking, are, 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 are our approaches to intervention consistent with those good practices? And finally, finally, the fifth question, which I won't go into because we'll, we have a session on this afternoon, is, is our approach to assessment looking at system level change as well as final, final impact. Let me just wrap up by saying a couple of very quick things. This is Diffid's approach. I've not talked about specific experiences of the approach in practice, but I could have, and I could have talked about, about significant uh, uh, impacts uh, in, in, in various situations where millions of people have actually been affected. Um, it's an approach which doesn't always work, but increasingly it is working. And it's an approach which sets out some challenges for us. The challenge, first of all, is that we should be thinking about our value chains as systems that we are trying to facilitate. 
where we're successful in our work, it's because we're changing the way that systems work. And we're not successful, the opposite is happening. So the challenge for us, for DFID, for USAID, I guess for, for you guys, is to be thinking about how we can tap into our learning uh, and experience. To be think about how we can use that to, to, to make value, ch value chain approach uh, better and more successful in the future. And that means thinking about value, that, that, that approach as about changing value chain systems. Okay. This has been a lot of information and a pretty inspiring ending from Alan. Uh, I'd like to take some questions from the floor. Can we have some lights so I can see people? Uh, over here. Hi, um, this is Simon Winter from TechnoServe. Um, TechnoServe works uh, both with USAID and with DFID on uh, value chain programs and market facilitation programs. And one of the challenges that we see, um, and I'd love to get the panel's reflection on, is when you have thin markets, when you don't have a lot of market actors who are already invested in the system who you can facilitate. What are your thoughts about that, particularly, for example, in the context of Senegal and Ghana, of course, but Alan, from your broader experiences as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thin markets. Yeah, you, that, that's exactly what happened when we, we went in the, uh, Neric, the Nerica Rice program and, and in the south of Senegal. There were no markets and there wasn't even any surplus commodity to sell. And so, uh, you really have to look for it. It's not always self-evident. You, you don't have any uh, market agents there. And so that's where you have to find where the structure is. The question is, though, do you have an opportunity? That's the first question. You, know, you can have a thin market, but a big opportunity, which is rice in Senegal. As long as you've got an opportunity, okay, then you can start working from there. If you, if you have a thin market and a thin opportunity, you're going to have a problem. But if you have a thin market, if you have a, you know, a thin series of actors, but a big opportunity, what's important is to see, and that's what I was explaining uh, earlier on, do you have underlying structures, okay? Now, they can be water user unions. I mean, uh, Anna Gay's program was, was a program led by some Austrian NGO like 15 years ago, and they were working on small gardening and things like that. But they had a structure, they had a project and a, a means of organizing a small holder base. And then you bring a technology that actually raises their competence. Now there wasn't only uh, one NGO. We found there were like 12 or 13 NGOs covering the whole countryside. And working with them because they had a vested interest in developing that energy and then building it from the ground up. And, and the thing is, though, it's not being impatient, not saying, why isn't Anagay already selling to Dabafal from the Vital Agro Industrial Mill? You know, why isn't there a big rice mill in the south of Senegal? Well, uh, you know, you don't want to push that. So there has to be some kind of step-by-step -step adequation process and build up the systems accordingly. I think that's, that's an approach, and you can actually get things to happen that way. Over here. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm Harold Roy McCauley. I'm the executive director of Cora Quetet. Um, once again, um, it's coming out the importance of um, scaling up and scaling out, and, um, and, and I think there's a third um, concept that's coming out of the discussions, and that's sustainability. Now, what I've had here this morning are great ideas, success stories. And um, we're talking about communities. We're talking about 30, 40,000 people. Now, I would like to hear from you what are the mechanisms that you have or you're thinking about in terms of scaling up. And when I'm talking about scaling up, I'm talking about actually integrating national governments to achieve sustainability. 
and then scaling out. And that, when I'm talking about scaling out, I'm talking about moving from communities, one community to several communities, to the whole country, and from one country to another. Now, I'm saying this because we have a similar experience in Kora Fuecad where we're working with national agricultural research systems and where also we also have a model that we're looking at in terms of scaling up and we're really separating them and scaling out. So I would like to know what you, what's your own op opinion about that, moving from these projects, because these are projects, and actually going into countries, bigger communities, countries, and then um, actually integrating the government systems. Yeah, th th thanks for the question. It, um, that's precisely why we want to, to try and focus on how systems work and try and get systems working more be better because uh, when they do work better, they have uh, uh, the incentive and, and, and the opportunity to, to, to grow and to change. And we could talk about other examples which are not about 30 or 40,000 people being affected, but, but hundreds of thousands and indeed millions. Um, the opportunity to, to scale up of course, depends on, it's, I'm afraid it's an it depends response. It depends on what the, what the situation is and whether there are scale agents, whether there are input suppliers, for example, who have a commercial uh, incentive to grow and to reach out to other, to other, uh, other communities, uh, uh, whether there are whether there are incentives that we can tap into amongst existing market players to grow and to reach beyond small scale. That's the whole rationale, the whole rationale for the approach. Um, we don't have time to go into that just now, but that is precisely why we talk about market systems and we don't talk about uh, small worthy things with, with small groups of people. And Jonas, now I know that you talked earlier about the importance of leadership and, and we don't usually think of leadership and, and scaling outcomes. Can you speak to that for a few minutes? Yes. Um, and really addressing your, your point, you know, through that lens, I can say, um, you know, you raised the question of government. Should government be the leader, the driving force of scaling up? And, and how, what would be the government's position in this? And I think a, a big element there is, you know, in, in our project, we've been able to, to take leadership and develop a good rapport with the Ministry of Agriculture in Senegal, uh, who counts on us actually on how to strangely enough, define the public-private relationship in the development of strategic sectors, for example, the seed sector. And so we have this dialogue with them, and, and their point is that uh, the government of Senegal doesn't really want to, you know, take back its former position as the main actor in the certification of seed, but is actually looking at experiments that we conducted in privatizing the seed controlling system and developing a more public-private approach to certified seed uh, production and control. And so once you develop that and kind of everyone understands and redefines the uh, position of government, the position of the private sector and maintain the objectives of both parties in, in the process, you can end up actually leveraging much more impact. What it means that, you know, if you develop, for example, a private seed controller framework with licensed seed controllers, well, you don't need to hire that many government, you know, hire, not the, the, you know, the notion of hiring additional government employees to carry out that seed control function disappears. You only need a few seed you know, license uh, auditors and things like that, and then you develop a more private-based and scaled-up uh, system that, that actually has a chance to grow and doesn't pull government resources and frees up private initiatives. So I think that's the kind of rapport you want to develop. You want to develop something that they can see, that inspires them, and then you develop a collaboration in scaling up the system, scaling up the model. Richard Cole. Hi, my name is uh, Richard Cole. I'm a scaling up consultant. I wanted to uh, follow up, Jean-Michel, <laughs> on the point that you made and others made in the earlier question, which is on this question of sequencing. 
the models that you both presented for Ghana and Senegal are actually pretty sophisticated. You've got crop insurance, you have warehouse relationships, you have market pull from large actors downstream. But in the uh, Feed the Future projects we've looked at, often we're talking about converting very small half a hectare or hectare farmers to who are largely subsistence farmers into the market and then growing that market. And often uh, it takes quite a while to build farmers associations, warehouses, not to mention all the more sophisticated things. So I guess I have two questions. One is, um, do you think it's really realistic to take a half a hectare farmer who's on a dollar a quarter a day or less and integrate them? Or is that a separate poverty issue that we expect other development things because they're not really commercializable? And secondly, back to your question of sequencing, Jean-Michel, how long does this take to build farmers associations, to build warehouses, to build the input supply, infrastructure, crop insurance, leasing, warehousing, this is pretty sophisticated stuff. This doesn't sound like a five-year project to me. So if you could both, all three of you, give a sense of the time frame to get to the kind of fairly sophisticated models that you both shared, that would be helpful. Yes, if I can start on that one. Um, the, the beauty of our model is the fact that it's not uh, all our project. Um, the, the crop insurance actually is a, is a different project and we're simply buying into that, investing in that. The weather insurance is a private company. We're simply helping them expand to farmers in the north. Um, the warehouse receipt program is something that uh, started two or three years ago. It has another uh, four years to go to mature. Um, uh, the radios and the ICT companies are, are also supported by other programs. Um, I work on about uh, 30 MOUs with other projects and other companies doing these types of things. So it's quite, uh, quite easy for me to, to, to handle all of that. Uh, I think it's, it's exactly you know, the, the, same, uh, the same kind of approach. So you want to, they call that hacking. I mean, it's a modern kind of hacking. You take applications, you get them together. You don't reprogram the whole system. You just develop connection and then you let these things work and you, make, and you work on the functioning of this system. Uh, there are associations. I mean, the last thing you want to do is create associations. You want to see what kind of organization is in the field. You want to really take stock of what is there and then work innovations through them and then to make them function. The thing though that is uh, all, you know, always, and that's why I wanted to stress it as a special element in my presentation, is the understanding of what's your market target. Of course, if we want the people from the south of Senegal to sell rice to huge rice mills and sell rice to Dakar, you're going to be very disappointed for a very long time, okay? But what is their market for? For a, a, a farmer below $1.25, just being able to sell certified seed at a premium in his community and to an agri-dealer just for a fraction of it and being able to cover his yearly needs is a big deal, okay? And so the question is, what are the big deals? In the Senegal River Valley, it's not that. In the Senegal River Valley, the guy is able to do seven tons per hectare once a year. The question is, how do you make him do it twice? Different objective, okay? But big impact and that leads on to additional steps uh, around, uh, you know, in terms of progress. So it's really a matter of gauging where you're at and where you want to go and developing some kind of progress and commercial progress that is realistic, okay? And that can build up to next stages. And John, I thought it would be interesting to hear from you about this issue of time, um, budgets and time to which you want to work and minimum. Okay, a couple things to say on, on that. First of all, this is not a view of the world that changes things through the, the size of your, of your budget. Obviously, you need to have resources, you need to have, you need to have budgets, but this is not about throwing money uh, and, and throwing money at problems and using that as a leverage for change because that tends to be quite superficial change. This is about ch changing things through the insight that you can bring. So making sure you're, you're asking the right questions and you have a right focus and direction for your, your various interventions. Um, so it's not necessarily something that relies upon on, 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 on huge budgets. T uh, time is often a function of the level of uh, weakness and fragility of the market context you work in. The weaker a market is, the more difficult it will be. The longer it will take. 
in, in markets which are pretty well functioning just now, but where there may be a few uh, identifiable key constraints, you can actually have quite a, a quick impact uh, substantially. It's also an iterative approach, as I think both of the guys here have referred to this, that as you develop, as you develop, and as you, as you introduce uh, change, other opportunities emerge and, other, uh, and, and scope for other, uh, other interventions. That means that time can be a, a precious resource here. Uh, rather than necessarily um, uh, lots, of, lots of money. I also want to mention we had a breakout session this afternoon about linking the poor uh, into markets, so please come to speak, to speak to that other issue that Richard brought up. But I'd like to thank our panel for a very interesting conversation.